rest of chapter 8, cohabitation and modern marriage. And with cohabitation, we're really just merely looking at living together as a sexual or a romantic couple without being married. So this is the norm within American society, not the exception. Almost 70% of U.S. adults have cohabited by the age of 50. Uh, this pattern is significantly more common amongst those who have less than a four-year degree. So again, we're looking at education being tied to, uh, in a lot of respects, marital status pretty significantly here in our society. So again, those U.S. citizens without four-year degrees, they're less likely to ever marry, often really having to do to lower economic security and having consequently less stable, committed, intimate relationships and partnerships. Aging is also something that matters with this pattern as well, in that we find cohabitation is increasingly common amongst older adults, with more than 60% of those aged 50 to 70 reporting that they were divorced or they are currently separated. So the risk factors perhaps within the aging process of remarriage in terms of losing income and wealth factor heavily in this kind of decision making. Also serial cohabitation is a reality and so with that we're looking at uh, a person having more than one cohabiting relationship over several years. So this is also for a lot of marriage and family researchers and practitioners a key predictor of family disruption and stress. Now, cohabitation has positives, it has negatives, it has its pros and its cons. So on the positive aspects, uh, cohabiting permits the sharing of household tasks such as budgeting and housework. So a lot of that, of course, can become burdensome for just one person. So if those things are pooled or shared or they are a collective activity, uh, cohabiting couples, they can maximize the quality and the quantity of the time that they have together. Now, the challenges, as you can imagine, there's one known as sort of, and the book talks about this, known as relationship inertia. So a couple may decide, okay, well, hey, we'll marry because it's the next step, not really having to do with any kind of active commitment-based decision-making. And so, again, if you've got that former sense of with the former, if you have that sense of, hey, well, we should just go ahead and jump into this, that's where, again, the research shows that there's a problem. Also, research shows that cohabiting has a lot, in, a lot, if you will, in common with both divorce, or I should say both marriage and dating. I have to correct that in my notes. So, yes, indeed, cohabiting has a lot in common with both dating and marriage. And so what that really means is that there are norms that uh, do happen with cohabiting, but that they're just not as well understood as the norms that we see with respect to uh, marriage. And so the norms aren't uh, as well understood, but they also don't have the same social significance as norms concerning marriage and a married couple family. Also, we know that cohabiting increased significantly amongst low in couples, low income, I should say, couples. Uh, during the Great Recession, so this was sort of a natural experiment, so something that just happened as society changed and evolved. And so the, this, if you will, natural experiment suggests that uh, in a lot of respects, these couples were motivated much more by financial constraints being crushed financially as opposed to a, a desire for a longer term kind of commitment. We know that today in modern marriage, it's a balance, a balancing act of deep commitment as well as personal choice. And so with that deep commitment, we're, off, we're often looking at mutual support uh, and mutual respect within the marriage, but also the balancing of that with a personal choice, the notion that marriage is yet one more example of individual success and individual effort. Uh, positives, as you can imagine, and this is borne out in the research that is longitudinal. So we're looking at long-term studies uh, they indicate that uh, the married, those who are married, are happier, they're healthier, and they are generally uh, are of higher social status, so that they're regarded as such at very least. Uh, like we said with education, marriage is clearly a means to social advantage, a way to get uh, those life chances, the better kinds of things that society can give people and grant people. Obviously, there are significant challenges in modern marriage today. A lot of the challenges include just the notion of, well, what does marriage really mean? What does it symbolize? Uh, for a lot of folks, it's a means to end poverty and out-of-wedlock births. And so the book talks about that in the politics of marriage, that in many ways, the government has used marriage to try to fix a lot of societal ills, particularly in terms of poverty. 
Uh, for others, marriage symbolizes it's a declaration of individual choice and rights, regardless of gender identity and sexual orientation. And then for others, it's a declaration of traditional values that people should uphold and try to go back and have. Also, of course, uh, marriage can, in many ways, particularly for women, often involve less freedom, more responsibility, and less social engagement if we're talking about women largely in straight marriages in contrast to men as well as to people who are single.